coming out tonight. My name is Amali. I'm the events coordinator here at Books Are Magic. Before we get started, I just have a few logistics to point out how, for how tonight's going to go. First off, we do ask that you keep your mask on at all times while at this event. We will be doing a hand-raised audience Q&A towards the end, so please start thinking of questions to ask and hold on to them. After the talk tonight, Isabel will be signing and personalizing books at the desk where you checked in. And of course, we have additional books available for purchase tonight. If you're joining us virtually on the YouTube live stream, we'd love to encourage you to buy a copy of NSFW online using the link in the live stream description. So with all that in mind, we are very excited to introduce Isabel Kaplan and Emily Gould, who are here celebrating the release of Isabel's debut novel, Not Safe for Work. NSFW follows a young, unnamed protagonist as she enters the television industry, courtesy of familial connections, and as she climbs the ranks, discovers the unsettling truths of Hollywood's corporate culture, and faces the difficult reality of trying to make change from within. This novel is incredibly captivating. It will make you chuckle and gasp. It will send shivers down your spine, and it will certainly give you something, something to think about long after you've finished. Isabel Kaplan graduated from Harvard and holds an MFA in creative writing from NYU. She is the author of the national best-selling young adult novel, Hancock Park, which we have two copies of tonight, um, and was born and raised in Los Angeles. As I mentioned before, Emily Gould joins Isabel in conversation. Emily is the author of And the Heart Says Whatever, Friendship, and Perfect Tunes, now available in paperback. She is a features writer at New York Magazine. So without any further delay, please join me in giving Emily and Isabel a warm welcome. Take, hey, take I, it away. Okay, <laughs> thank you so much to everyone for being here. I'm gonna kick us kick us off with just a very brief reading, and I promise to keep it short. Um, these are the opening few pages of NSFW. The thing about Los Angeles is that it's awful and I hate it. But when I'm there, nowhere else exists and I can't imagine leaving. It's a difficult place to be old or sick or fat or poor or without a strong social media presence. It's not an easy place to be young either. After college graduation, I postponed my return from Boston by one week, then two, cat sitting for a professor. It's the second week that drives my mother over the edge. She calls, she emails, she accuses me of loving the professor's cat more than her. She says, don't I know how hard she has been working, how lonely and depressed she has been, how she has been counting down the days until my return. I get sick upon arrival, aching limbs at baggage claim, blooming into a fever by the following day. Garden variety virus, but it hits my mother's sweet spot. You're run down, poor baby, I'll take care of you, she says. My father sends a welcome home text. Hope to see you for dinner soon, he writes. He doesn't ask where I'll be living or if I'd like to stay with him. I suspect he doesn't want the infringement on his space, his freedom. It's strange being back in my mother's house. She has just finished renovating and it barely looks familiar. Though somehow, items from long ago, CD players, pants from Gap Kids, have resurfaced in the new version of my old bedroom. The sight of them is unsettling. My parents divorced when I was 10, during the summer before fifth grade. They were civil, but it was terrible. My mother suggested we go on a diet together. It'll be fun, she told me. <laughs> You'll look great for the start of the school year. She said she knew I had been overeating because I could tell she was unhappy in her marriage. <laughs> this was news to me. She taught me all about calories and the places they hide. I dipped carrots in Dijon mustard while my friends at day camp traded Skittles and M&Ms, candy coatings melting in a rainbow sphere on their palms. My weeks were split between my parents. My father kept the house in the Hollywood Hills, and my mother moved to an apartment in Santa Monica, across the street from the beach. There was an infinity pool on the roof and towels were provided. She called it Heartbreak Hotel. A few nights a week, 
I would ride my scooter to the Third Street Promenade with my mother and younger brother. While my brother browsed the toy store, I punished myself in the basement fitting rooms of Gap Kids, trying on jeans two sizes too small and watching my stomach pucker as I did up the button. I practiced sitting casually on the bench in the fitting room, as if I were on a playground bench at recess. I may believe I was talking about normal things with my classmates and kept an eye on my stomach in the mirror. My mother moved several times over the next five years, a real tour to West LA, <laughs> before landing back in Santa Monica, two miles east of Heartbreak Hotel. When I think back on those years, I remember a choking sensation. My father's silence, my mother's longing, my brother's rage, my bottomless hunger. My psychiatrist kept increasing dosages, switching medications. Trial and error, she said. I would stare at the tapestry behind her head and say week after week, I wanna stop falling asleep in class. The day my mother moved into this house was also the day I got drunk for the first time. Early evening, a bottle of Grey Goose on the kitchen counter, a carton of orange juice next to it. I helped myself. If you drink that screwdriver, you can't drive, my mother said. I said I didn't care, and I drank that one, and then another and another, until the floor tilted. I was 15. I couldn't drive at night on a learner's permit anyway. My parents were both from New England, high-achieving youngest children of long-suffering Jewish immigrant mothers. A perfect match on paper. My mother moved to Los Angeles for my father, a literary historian who moved for his research, wooed by a trove of archives acquired by USC. My mother often said that my father was the only person who would willingly relinquish tenure at Harvard. It took me a long time to understand the double-edged slice of that comment. My mother never liked Los Angeles, but she also never left. She stayed for my brother and me so that our lives would be stable and that we could have a close or closer relationship with our father. She made do with what she believed to be a pale imitation of the career she imagined having in Boston where her star was on the rise in her expertise as a lawyer and legal activist doing groundbreaking work on victims' rights and rape laws was more highly valued. Until I went to college, I didn't know where my mother ended and I began. A lack of differentiation more common in toddlers than teenagers. It was a problem my mother didn't recognize as such, which was of course part of the problem. Her life's purpose was to sacrifice and provide for me, and mine was to make her feel sufficiently loved in return. What could possibly go wrong? <laughs> um, Isabel, I just wanted to start by saying how much I love this book. I love this book so much. Um, and it's, it's, sort of a, it's sort of rare to have uh, love at first, love at first sentence. <laughs> Um, it, cause it's such a dynamite first, well, the whole first, the whole first paragraph, <laughs> the whole thing, everything you just read was really fantastic, but yeah, like, you know, it's, it's, uh, it's, un, it's unbeatable. And so I wanted to start by asking whether when you were first beginning to work on this book, that was where you started or whether that was something that you, that came later in the process. That first paragraph is one of the only paragraphs that made it through from first draft to final untouched. Um, that was the first, those were the first sentences I wrote and they remained the first sentences throughout the writing and rewriting and rewriting process and so much got cut, like an immense amount got <laughs> cut. Um, like, like half a book got cut. Uh, but that was there from the start and I wrote those sentences shortly after leaving LA um, and I had moved to New York for grad school and I had, you know, just like, like an inch of distance, which is not a lot of distance, but like just enough perspective to start writing that. And I didn't know where I was going from there, but the cognitive dissonance that I was clearly most interested in exploring took root there and it kept going and so much, so much got cut, but that, um, but I, <laughs> And I can see both my editor and agent laughing <laughs> behind their masks, even though they are half covered. Um, but, but that really set the tone for what I wanted to accomplish for the rest of the book. Um, I'm now really curious about all of the <laughs> stuff that got left on the cutting room floor, but maybe that's not like a 
a great line of inquiry. Mm -hmm. So um, for those of you who haven't had a chance to read this book yet, um, Isabel's book is deft and witty and very plot driven and um, a real page turner and you could easily read it on the beach, but it also deals very adroitly with some some real hot button topics. And I feel like the great strength of the book is actually how those things are incorporated into this like plotty propulsive narrative in a way that actually is feels very it felt very realistic to me in terms of just that like rape and sexual harassment are just things that happen to you. <laughs> Not like, you know, the defining incident of uh, you know, a protagonist's young life. Um, I'm curious about how you focused in on what would be sort of like the major plot arcs of the book. Because there's sort of, there's sort of like, there's like the protagonist's, you know, it's sort of a building's roman. She's like getting closer and closer to figuring out like who she is and differentiating herself from her mom who has an enormous personality and and what she wants to do with her life but then there's also all of this like big picture societal forces and like industry stuff like when did you how did you plot it out and like conceptualize it like did you have like a you know carrie matheson style like <laughs> board full of like red string or like what did how did you figure it out so I wrote the entire first draft of this novel longhand, like a crazy person, um, in a series of spiral notebooks, uh, which I did sort of basically as a way of tricking myself because I am like a compulsive perfectionist who would overdo, would do like the homework and then, you know, the homework 10 more times before finishing. and. It was a way of tricking myself into thinking like this is a really rough draft and I will, you know, I'll have to change it when I type it up so I might as well just write whatever now. If you're looking to write a novel in like a really efficient manner, I don't necessarily <laughs> recommend that. Um, but, but also like the only kind of novel you can finish is the one that's finished. Mm -hmm. And so it was really helpful for me in getting through. Um, I, a lot it was a process of elimination, like really, you know, getting the plot to where it is now was really a process of elimination. And it was tough because I wanted it to feel both, you know, propulsive and like it had a tight plot. But I think so much of being in your 20s is like everything coming at you in your life all at once in a way that does not feel narratively cohesive and like it makes any sense. It's just a <laughs> lot of stimuli inputting and you needing to figure out like what you're gonna do with that information. And I and also like what is you? Yeah, and like yeah. what is you? Who are you? Like yeah. what is it? Like what is an identity? What is what is your life? And what are you doing here? And there's no like pause to assess and figure out which is part of your narrative and which is part of society's narrative and what's being imposed upon you and what you know you're gonna do for you. And there's no space for that. And it's I, I'm most interested in like there's a process of accumulation where like you're like I've got it under control I've got everything under control I've got everything under control I've got everything under control and then what's the moment where suddenly it's oh no I don't have everything under control and that requires sort of careful calibration of the accumulating outside forces and all of that that to create that sense of build and I the fiction I love most is like really funny until it's really not mm -hmm. and like lives in that place that's sort of in between humor and pain and I wanted to do that there and it's not you know necessarily an obvious pitch so like I'd like to do a really funny novel about sexual harassment <laughs> it's not like you know doesn't really roll off the tongue but um, <laughs> um well that that leads me so beautifully into my next question which is um were there any specific books or authors who you drew inspiration from as you were working on this like it, even just in terms of structure Structurally, no, I wish I had figured that out earlier on because then maybe I would have saved myself a lot of pain. But um, in terms of novels, I love voice-driven fiction where it feels really propelled by a narrative voice. And um, and that's, you know, that's people like Nora Ephron's Heartburn and Jenny Offal's Department of Speculation. And I love Laurie Moore's short stories. And, you know, all of those have the sort of the crispness and tightness and I, like the sense of like the razor thin line between what's moving and what's funny and are you laughing at something that's actually really painful? And that's what I was hoping most to get. 
Um, well, you nailed it. Um, so in, in thinking about the sort of, okay, well, I wanted to ask you about your job. <laughs> so um, you, you work in, um, you work right now at a literary agency and your job is to find literary works that might have uh, the potential to become film or TV projects. How did that not like poison your brain as you were putting the finishing touches on your own book? Like, how did you resist the temptation to like <laughs> optimize this for like ultimate, you know, optionability? Um, well, <laughs> first of all, or, I, or did you? <laughs> I finished this book before I started this job, so that was in okay, fact a really helpful <laughs> gap of time. Um, and. Second of all, I'm really, really good at cognitive dissonance. Mm -hmm. Like, it's a thing I've perfected over the years. If you want any tips on how to proceed with things that are untenable, I'm your girl. Maybe you should go to med school. Yeah, <laughs> I'm really, really good at that. Um, but I, I mean, honestly, now I, I work with book people all day, which is a very different, like, I, I feel like I'm the Hollywood translator, which is its own set of complicated things to deal with because I come in and it's like, I'm sorry, I know what I'm about to say. I can hear myself, please, I'm sorry, I you know. <laughs> this is all I got. Um, and it's, it feels very much like it's trying to sneak great things through a system that's really problematic. I, I used to work in broadcast television, which is uh, very different. And that, that was a whole different set of worms. And, um, and that, I don't know where I was going with that, but that, oh, that's well, like maybe separate, we can like, go back to like whether that poisoned your fiction. <laughs> um, no, it gave me great material. Oh, okay. Like, <laughs> it was in fact um, ultimately very useful, um, and I in ways that I didn't know it would be because obviously you don't with being in your early twenties you just do things like running into rooms and suddenly I'm here and like what what am I doing now? <laughs> uh, where am I? What have I chosen for myself? And so like my twenties have felt. I'm now in my 30s, so I can speak retrospectively. <laughs> All the wisdom of my 32 years is that my 20s felt like running into a series of rooms and looking around and thinking, oh man, like wh where, where am I, what have I done? Um, I think, I mean, it's hard not to have it seep in a little bit, and I hope that in like the best version of it, what seeped in was a focus on like keeping storylines tight, not giving anyone any space to lose interest or stop reading, and that sense of like, you know, there's a really narrow margin for when someone will put something down. Um, but, but it was tough. I did not get a lot of writing done when I was working as a TV assistant. And, um, but I will say like it was, you know, I was able to cultivate niches that I didn't expect, like to be the person who specialized in women and books. <laughs> who would have thought that was a whole niche? <laughs> but those together became my area of expertise. And I will say because of that niche and that area of expertise, your book, Friendship, was one of the first pitches I heard because mm -hmm. it was like, women and books, I got mm -hmm. this. <laughs> yeah. And that's what led to the incredibly lucrative, uh, you know, six series of the Showtime uh, Friendship Project that you've all seen. I, that's how I bought my brownstone. Yeah. So. <laughs> Unfortunately, the response afterwards was, well, it's women and books. <laughs> So it's narrow. Yeah. Yeah. Well, but you know, it gives you material in ways you don't know you'll have till later. Yeah, no, but um, it, it's all it's all. Uh, what did what did Dora Ephron's mom always say to her? Everything's coffee. Yeah, everything's content. <laughs> um, <laughs> Updating it for a modern age. Yeah, um, I think we should toss it to the audience because I know that a lot of you have read this book and probably have some questions for Isabel. Because it's being um, also broadcast on YouTube, I'm gonna you're gonna say raise your hand, and say your question, and then I'm gonna repeat the question so that the phone can hear it, um, and um, I will try to not paraphrase you in a way that renders what you said inaccurate or dumb. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yes. I know that in your Hollywood assistant days, you definitely memorized a lot of really good orders for people's things. <laughs> Do you remember any of your boss's orders and what were they, where were they from? Okay, so the question is, when Isabel was a Hollywood assistant, she had to memorize a lot of lunch orders. What were the, does she, can she do any of them off the top of her head? I mean, I can still remember like my first publishing boss's 
lunch order from for days when he was sad and days when <laughs> and days when he was like being good, uh -huh. you know. I can give you ten people's La Scala chop salad orders <laughs> with the preferred additions, substitutions, and subtractions. And really, I, yeah, just off the top of my head, could tell you who wants pepperoncinis, who wants extra garbanzo beans but no mozzarella, <laughs> who wants chicken, who wants so, no chicken. So, like, do it. <laughs> Prove it. Yeah. Um, you know, I feel like I've got to leave like a little bit to mystery, um, it's, it's fair, but you know, and not everyone wants to hear the the roast chicken chopped listed a bunch of times. Did you sign say, an NDA? <laughs> I didn't, which was a real missed opportunity um, yeah. for my employer. Um, but <laughs> I, not my editor is breaking down in front of me. It's fine. I had a legal read. We're all fine. Um, it's great. But I I spend spent an immense amount of time de dealing with food preferences. Like truly, mm -hmm. I could not overstate the hours in my day <laughs> that I spent addressing like bottled water preferences and what was acceptable and what was absolutely not acceptable. Fiji, Fiji acceptable, smart water acceptable, Nestle, the, Nestle was the cheapest, so like you bought it in bulk and no one wanted it. Mm -hmm. But it was all we had. Then there was the time where we only had Perrier. So if you came for a pitch, it was like, I'm so sorry, we don't have still. We only have sparkling. Welcome. Um, but we yet yeah, no. When I worked um, the network I was at, there was a um, contract for the company named Dr. Soda, who was just like this one dude who somehow had the contract for my entire network and his website for snack orders also described his marital history and, <laughs> and mentioned that he married his wife after just one date. Uh, and it also flagged, uh, we sometimes make mistakes, but we try our best. <laughs> and that was really the situation. It was like, you ordered Diet Coke, you got Sprite. You, and it was just every day, you try to order your best, you get something else. And, um, and there's something really, you know, dispiriting and demoralizing about realizing that, like, my chances of being a television executive and giving meaningful notes on TV pilots have to do with whether I got the right dentine ice gum and if I got it fast. And because I got this dentine ice gum fast, I've won a lot of respect around here. <laughs> so real. Um, um, I wanted to ask what you think it is about Los Angeles that makes it so compelling for writers to describe and what is it that made it so compelling for you to describe? So, sorry, the question is, what is it about Los Angeles that makes it so compelling for writers to describe and for you to describe? So for me personally, my great cross to bear in life is that I am from Los Angeles. <laughs> and I have many times wished that were not the case. And, and throughout my childhood was reminded by my parents, you know, we're not like them, we're not from here. Mm -hmm. But the problem with that situation was that I was from there. <laughs> so that was all well and good for them to say, you know, we're not like these people, but I was. I had no other context. Like, this was it. And you can be told that something's not normal all you want, but if there's nothing else, it's default normal. Mm -hmm. And then the things that are like just medium outlandish become like oh, super grounded and normal. And, um, and for me, I, when I was a teenager, wrote a young adult book about LA and was like, this is it, I've done it, I've captured LA, I'm leaving, I'm never coming back, it's of no interest or use to me. Cut to, you know, 15 years later and here I am. Um, and I effectively kept moving back to LA like every two years or so in my adulthood. Um, and I think, I mean, I think what's so compelling is that it's like everything at its most exaggerated, ridiculous, State. Like it's, you know, it's a lot of things that are not special to LA, they are elsewhere, but it is the most heightened version of all those things. And the entertainment industry is like, is ludicrous, like in a way that, you know, makes publishing seem really grounded, <laughs> like really, really reasonable because of the, you know, the personalities and the fact that, you know, who, how you seem matters way more than anything you've ever done. And, um, and all of that I found really compelling. And I, I wanted nothing more than to not write a Los Angeles book. And I kept trying to write books elsewhere. And this is, you know, this is my best material, apparently. <laughs> <laughs> the next one won't be about LA, but I think there's, you know, it's. So you, so you claim. So I claim. For right now, the next one is not about LA. But I, I see a lot of people in this room who I know have spent time in LA. Um, and it's, you know, it's, 
it's a fishbowl in a really special way. Um, and I mean special in the good and bad senses. <laughs> Um, so the question is whether writing about um, that um, very intense, fraught period of uh, the protagonist's 20s was re-traumatizing or whether it, uh, it helped you to like process stuff that had happened to you. I think it was, I mean, it was helpful closure in a way. And I don't think I could have written this book while I was living the period of time described in the book because I needed a sense perspective from it and and by the time I finished the book I felt distinctly older than than a 22 year old than the character who started this book and then you know and also different and older than I was when I started writing the book and I think that's probably like it's helpful in the desensitization way where it's like each time each draft you you get a little more separate from it so by the time it's ready to to go out into the world I can treat it like it's completely detached from me and practice my cognitive dissonance once mm -hmm. more. Um, but I think it was it was helpful in that it allowed me to put it in into its place narratively. And I've always been someone who, you know, deals with every emotion in my life by writing things, not like for public consumption, mostly like for myself usually, but that like I need to figure out how to articulate a feeling. And if I can't articulate it right, then I it still feels like it has some power over me. But if I can somehow communicate it in a way that I can contextualize it and make it make sense and fit it into a narrative structure, then it's like, oh, I've got it. I've like, I can put it in the box and now I can have it in that box and let it be there. Um, but do not let that uh, make you think that I have conquered all the issues that I have written about. It turns out that they can pop up like a jack in the box <laughs> over and over again. You can put them in the box and they spring right back up. <laughs> Um, so one of the things that I love the most about this book is how it was both like a professional story and like a family story. And I was curious like if it, if in your writing the novel, it was always had those like two parts like dancing with each other or like how that came to be. Um, so the question is whether um, in writing the novel, Isabel always had um, the two uh, narratives of the the story of the narrator's relationship with her family, especially her mother, and also her professional life, and those sort of like uh, being separate and then like colliding, um, or how, or whether that came to be in some other way. Yeah, I mean, those two were very much the like the foundational poles that I was working with as I was writing, and I had sort of the image of like it's like a ping pong match where you're being bounced back and forth, and no one is asking about what you need and what you're like, who you are or what you're doing, but the trying to meet other people's needs. And I wanted to play with the idea that, you know, that the narrator is actually set up to be a really good assistant because she's really accustomed to treating another person's comfort as a precondition for her own. And like that has prepared her to be a good assistant. And if you can do that in your personal life and your professional life, you succeed, but also what kind of success is that? And you know, at what cost? And what does that do to you over time? And so those were the, I wanted to play with those tensions and also the idea that, you know, everything she's doing, her work life and her personal life, they're both trying to take up her whole life. There's no sense of, you know, someone wanting your nine to five and your off hours. It's the, how do you, and how do you carve out space for a self in the middle of that? And so those were always the two big, factors that I was working with and then obviously you know trying to fit social life within that but I think so often in your 20s your social life does feel work adjacent and it doesn't feel separate and it feels like it's, it's a really slippery boundary between what you're doing for work and what you're doing for your personal life and what's for your personal life that might help you at work and what's for work that might help your personal life and I wanted to show all of those boundaries sort of eroding until there are none left and it's just a garbage fire. <laughs> um, given how specifically you refer to House of Mirth in the book, spoiler alert, um, I wonder if you could talk about 
the relationship between your work and that book and whether it informed how you thought about your protagonist and her struggles? The question is um, whether the House of Mirth, which you refer to specifically in the book, um, informed uh, the plot of the book and the protagonist and her struggles. Um, I don't think there was like an explicit Wartonian, you know, narrative within my work, but I, I love Edith Wharton. I think she does an incredible job of writing about social dynamics and gender and the particular um, social world that she operated within. Um, the, the, I don't think it's a big spoiler to share that Edith Wharton and House of Mirth come up because the narrator, the first pitch that she gets to attend, she jumps in on because it's a House of Mirth in Silicon Valley. <laughs> and she knows going into the pitch that nobody will ever buy this pitch. <laughs> And but she's jumping in anyway, and um, and I think I mean that came into play because I wanted to also play with the idea that she's willing to like she loves Edith Wharton and is now about to refer to Edith Wharton as underlying material, mm -hmm. and like is not going to realize that she's changed the language that she's talking about one of the books that she deeply loves until she gets to that point because you do what you have to do to get in the room and get there. And the ways that she changes her thinking about like the novels that she cares the most about is part of the aha moment and the breakdown of like this is, you know, it's really subtle. It's the frog in boiling water. You can think that you're doing something to elevate the work of Edith Wharton in a novel you love so much. And suddenly you're sitting there talking about like cryptocurrency in a Silicon Valley mansion and how this is really gonna do a service somehow to one of Edith Wharton's great books. <laughs> I read an interview of yours where you said that um, Hollywood is an unethical institution and that, in fact, there are no ethical institutions. Mm. I was interested in that, <laughs> and, but I, want, I wanted to know, and, I, and it's very serious, you know, and I love yeah. serious story and comments mm -hmm. like that. Um, I'm wondering what is the benefit for you for writing, like, a comic novel about being trapped in an unethical institution as opposed to, like, other modes that you could have chosen. Um, so maybe kind of going more into humor and like cultural and social critique and, and why why humor. I mean, oh, oh sorry, sorry, sorry. <laughs> we have to keep doing this. Sorry, mm -hmm. um, really quick. Uh, um, humor as a mode of social critique. Uh, Isabel said in an interview that there are no ethical institutions. Why then uh, set a book in Hollywood, et cetera. <laughs> um, I stand by that comment. I think, <laughs> I think there are no ethical institutions. Um, I think we're all trapped in a burning building. I have no solution. I am here in the burning it building. Is, it is really hot in here. <laughs> it is warm. Um, I am in this burning building, operating within the burning building, telling you that the building is on fire and we should all continue spending time in it, um, which is its own other set of issues. Um, I mean, I think on the one hand, there's the like, you know, tragedy plus time is comedy. Um, on the other hand, I think that, you know, humor is, can be both an effective coping mechanism for dealing with trauma. And it's also because nothing is ever only one thing. And I think that that is so much like the way we live life. And that's also, I thought like the best way into the complexity and, you know, that like, if I sat here saying that I've written a screed about how there are no ethical institutions and all ethical institutions are gone, they're all fake, everything's terrible, please read my structural critique on capitalism, I wouldn't read that book. Like I would think, you know, that sounds like a great book and I would love to tweet one thing about that <laughs> and, um, and plan to read it and then just not be quite in the mood. But like, I really support it. And, um, and I, on, you know, on the most basic level, wanted to write a book that I wanted to read. And I also think that, you know, at, you know, Hollywood is completely fucked. And in, you know, it, not in a different way than like the rest of, you know, America is, but in a way that feels very heightened and very prominent and very absurd. And I, that happened to be the industry that I had the most experience with. And you know, I think a lot of the workplace dynamics that are in the book are not exclusive to Hollywood. They are just most heightened and absurd there because the situations are ridiculous in like truly like the stakes 
so low, the emotions so high, <laughs> um, the you know the celebrity profiles also high, and it felt like a good way in, but I don't think it's specific to Hollywood. And I think I was also just like, it's really funny to be a Hollywood assistant. Like it is, it's horrible and it's exploitative and it's terrible and it's hilarious. Mm -hmm. Like it's really deeply funny. And um, and getting through that by a, like taking note of those things and appreciating those things was part of how I got through it myself was that, you know, like you have to appreciate the absurdity of, you know, of all the emails you get from the standards and practices department telling mm -hmm. you that in the name of, you know, being good to women, um, this is, we've circled the butts of the women in this bikini <laughs> party and we're going to show you which butts are too much butt. <laughs> <laughs> and you'll need to put bigger bathing suits on them somehow. And so here is a series of images of women's butts circled for the ones that have too much ass cheek showing. And like, this is like, this is a serious work day. A serious work day is I now need to download 30 images of women in bikinis with like a yellow highlighter circling the ones that have a little too much cheek showing. And this is all somehow to further the representation of women on screen <laughs> and to like improve equality for women. Mm -hmm. And like when you dig deep into that, it's terrible. It's also really funny. <laughs> and I wanted to show how both of those things could live together. Okay, uh, the question is, uh, in the book, the protagonist, <laughs> mother and brother and father are described in unflattering ways. How has that affected the author's <laughs> relationship with her family? Thank you, Emily, and thank you, Melissa. I went to college. <laughs> As did she, with me. <laughs> did we learn about the death of the author <laughs> in college? Yeah. I mean, um, <laughs> it's a novel, <laughs> so it's fiction. Um, I think I, I've been doing that for a long time, so it's hopefully not like news to anyone that I write um, and. My parents were both at my LA launch last week, which was lovely, and it's um, great to have the support. But I think, I mean, I wrote a novel because I think that that's more creatively interesting and more liberating, and that I didn't want to be limited to the experiences that I have had. And and the irony is, is like I, I had to cut all the things that actually happened to me, and like that's the like you know the, like my first real frustration was like. Yeah, everything that happened to me has now been cut and I had to make up the plot. <laughs> so annoying. And then I kept like trying to sneak in little scenes and then I kept getting feedback like, this doesn't seem like it fits here. What is it doing here? It's like, it fits here because it happened. <laughs> and so of course it should be there because isn't it important? And the process from like drafting to actually finishing the book is it sometimes it's like, no, just because that happened to you and felt really meaningful doesn't mean it's for this novel. And so it was like a gradual process of all those chapters and scenes got chopped away. And then in the end, what I was left with was something that felt, you know, emotionally true to a lot of feelings I've had and accurate to environments I've been in. But as far as, you know, narrative, made that up. So it turns out it's a novel. <laughs> <laughs> and that's how fiction is made. <laughs> um, I have one. I have. I have one last question for Isabel, and then I think that's our last, and we're, then we're all gonna go get <laughs> some alcohol, um, if we, if that's a thing that we do. Um, so, um, okay. What's the TV film interest situation for the book right now? <laughs> um, I TBD. Uh, hopefully, I will have more details soon, but... I'll keep watching The Hollywood Reporter. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. Keep keep watching the trades, and hopefully we can find someone who wants to criticize Hollywood within Hollywood. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I mean, have you, like, like, the 
the last three shows I watched all simultaneously were just satires of Hollywood. So like, you know. Hopefully there's an audience. I think there is. I don't know. I mean. Fingers crossed. From I mean, your mouth to whoever is watching on this iPhone. <laughs> <laughs> all right. And bye. bye. <laughs>